What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a couple of more recently encountered uh, diseases in cattle that we've been dealing with from what little I've heard already out in the hallway, plus also from uh, some of our animal health company representatives they have experienced that in, in this part of the country also. Uh, but I also call them non-respiratory diseases. And one of the things I get to do, I get to do a lot of research, and one of my special interests is respiratory disease or shipping fever pneumonia in cattle. And we do a lot of that work up there at OSU. But two diseases that I thought that would be very interesting for you, plus also I'm getting a lot of calls this year in 2013 we're going to talk a little bit about pink eye and a little bit about foot rot. But also, hopefully, I'll, we'll go through some information, share some information. I'll try and make it practical. And then if you have questions, and it doesn't have to be on this, I will sure do my best to try, try to answer for you. Okay. Pink eye. That's a common name. I put up some of these medical terms because uh, looking in some of, like, Beef Today, Beef Magazine, High Plains Journal, they're going to sometimes use the long medical terms but it's kerato, uh, infectious bovine kerato conjunctivitis or IBK. That's pink eye. And pink eye is kind of a, a, a name about inflammation there of the eye. Generally, younger cattle are going to be more susceptible and hence exhibit more severe clinical signs than older cattle, just a rule of thumb. Now remember and understand what a rule of thumb is. It works most of the time, but not necessarily every time. So I'm gonna have someone say, well, you know, I had some cows, some adult cows, and they were four or five years old, and they got worse pink eye this year than my calf. Yep, that can happen. That's not a surprise. But most of the time, it's your younger calves are going to be more severely affected than your yearlings or your replacement heifers more severely affected than your, your cows or bulls. The other thing that's interesting that you might be uh, reflecting on, let me just see a, a show of hands. Have any of you experienced pink eye in your herds this year? Anybody? Okay. About a third, 35, 40%, somewhere along in there. That's quite a few. If you kind of look, calves born to younger cows, so your first and second calf heifers, generally will exhibit a little bit higher incidence than calves born from older cows. Part of that theory is that these older cows have already been exposed to the different causative agents of pink eye and therefore they're able to mount an immune response and pass some of that protection on to those young calves, their offspring, through some of the colostrum. That's the theory behind it, and that's also kind of logical as we would back that up. Bull calves also will have a little bit higher incidence, and because of the higher incidence, more cases you see, some of them are going to be more severe than heifer calves. The thought behind that is that generally it would be like some, some teenage boys they generally get in a little bit more mischief, a little bit more active than maybe teenage girls. You can kind of put that analogy in there. But because they're more interested to kind of look around the uh, pastures a little bit more, they might want to, who's king of the mountain, so to speak, and developing their social hierarchy or their dominance patterns. They might be button heads more, going through more weeds, uh, dusty more conditions when they're pawing up dirt, and get more irritation to the eye. Now, what are things to observe? Some of these things are going to be very subtle or some of the earlier clinical signs and then progress on to some of the more severe signs. A lot of times you're going to see lacrimation or tearing. And what that will occur is generally on the inside corner of one, could be both eyes, but generally one eye to start with, you're going to notice that there'll be a little darker line coming down on the side of the nose and that's where the tears are coming down because the tears are trying to wash some of the irritation off of the surface of the, of the eyeball. And generally, most of the time, we're talking about an infectious agent here. What will happen as this progresses, it'd be like if, uh, does anybody, okay, you all work on farms or ranches, I'm assuming, right? Have you ever had to pound a steeple in a post to keep a piece of barbed wire? Anybody here have to do that? Okay. Probably you all haven't experienced this, but I have. My depth perception may not be accurate, and every once in a while I'll hit my thumb. Now, I know nobody's ever hit your thumb, right? Putting in a steep, okay. Everybody's in agreement on that. Well, if you've ever seen a person like me, what happens to your thumb the next day? Black and blue, and? And it hurts, and generally it's a little bit larger, right? It swells up. Part of that black and blue is due to the little blood vessels being burst and, and bleeding hemorrhage underneath. But then also 
the body's natural response is send some fluid in there to help dilute things out, whatever caused the injury to, in my case, the thumb. But what happens because the eye is trying to wash that infection and irritation off, fluid gets in there and it thickens a little bit layer of the eyeball itself and it will look bluish in color. So every once in a while you might even see, well, it's not a pink eye, it's a blue eye. Well, this is generally the precursor of what happens in the process of the development of the pink eye. Of course, because of the irritation, it's just like in human beings, the, uh, underneath the eyelid and around the, the white part of the eye, the sclera, it's going to be reddened and it's going to be inflamed, again, like my thumb, a little hemorrhage and stuff. It's going to uh, have a conjunctivitis, same, same as in a human. What can happen, which is a very, very severe case and hopefully doesn't happen to many animals or we can administer maybe some treatment early enough on that we can get some response and prevent this, but if left uh, untreated or in some cases even with treatment, it'll progress and it'll rupture the thin little layers, the uh, infection will eat down through the layers and actually part of the fluid in the eye will rupture out. But when that happens, generally it's that the eye's gone, it'll heal up with some scar tissue, and, and you've pretty much lost the eye. As time goes on, let's take my example of my thumb that I smashed. Eventually, the, the real throbbing part of the pain's going to go away in a, a couple of days, right? The swelling's going to go down, and eventually the, the blue-black, it'll change to color, it'll be kind of a, a greenish blue and then kind of a yellowish color. Has anybody ever seen a bruise do that? All right, that's a normal healing process. Well, on the eye, what will happen, there'll be little blood vessels that'll grow out over the surface of the cornea or the surface of the eyeball, and that's part of the healing process. So when you see blood vessels, that's on the kind of hopefully the backside of it with the healing, and eventually we can't even see a little white spot left in the, the surface part of the eyeball itself called the cornea and that's generally a, a healed lesion. And here's just an example that you can see up here you've all probably seen. But see that little spot right there in the corner of that up your upper left that uh, little uh, reddish brown calf that's where they start early on in the lacrimation or the tearing. And I know these particular pictures because these are from research calves in which uh, the, the veterinarian who's doing the research is a good friend and colleague of mine and she allowed me to borrow these slides specifically for these type of meetings to, to help people out. But we can monitor and we can time things when we're, we're trying to create the disease and then intervene with different types of treatments or preventive measures so that we can help hopefully get something to help you folks in, with the cattle out there. But that's what will happen early on. They'll, they'll get some of this lacrimation or tearing. And then you can kind of see, now this is a little bit older, but I've got lesion, meaning blemish, but you can kind of see that blue tint color right there. That is edema or fluid building up on the cornea or the surface of the eyeball itself. And then, of course, you can see right in here uh, the, the redness of the eyeball itself, the blood uh, coming around, and then the little blood vessels coming in on the side trying to lift that up and clean up the infection. Okay. Causes. Uh, here, here is one in which the names have actually kind of changed, but I left the older name up because that's the one that's still commonly used. Classic pink eye is caused by a bacteria called Moraxella bovis, and that's the, the very first one up there. That's the one that most of the different vac vaccines or Bactrins technically that are out there, Bactrin or Toxoid that are available, those vaccines are generally specific for this, uh, the fully licensed USDA products. The other species that is in that family, but it is different, used to be called Moraxella brominella subspecies ovus. Big long name, they have more recently accepted the term Moraxella, Moraxella bovoculi. Uh, the interesting thing when talking to uh, microbiologists or people that like to culture viruses and bacteria, things like that. Some of them use the old name and some are using the new name and there's even question about that. But just so you're aware, there, there's a couple out there. The nice thing, both of these are generally susceptible to the normal antibi antibacterial or antimicrobial antibiotic treatments we would administer to treat a case of pink eye if it gets to the disease versus trying to prevent it. 
The other one that's coming up, and this has kind of gone in cycles over the years, and probably last five, six, seven years or so, there's another species of, we, we lump it into bacteria. Technically, it is a unique organism itself because it does not have a cell wall, and it's a mycoplasma species, generally mycoplasma bovis. That requires a special culture, and normally when we take a culture like a swab of the eye, we can send it to the laboratory, and generally, roughly about three-ish days, three to four days or so, we'll have the answer back and kind of know what we're dealing with. Might need some additional tests if we have to go on, but generally a very short period of time we can have some, some information. This particular rascal, though, we might not be able to get a result for seven or eight days or maybe even a little bit longer. So we're dealing with something totally different, and part of it is this organism, this microbe, microorganism, does not have a cell wall. Clinically, so in other words, when I'm standing here looking at a calf with a pink eye lesion, I cannot tell the difference or I cannot say this one's a moraxella and this one's a mycoplasma. As I'm getting ready to tell you the one next one also. They look, they can look exactly the same and unless the culture is performed, we won't know which one we're dealing with. The last one, bovine herpes virus type 1, BHV1. Another common term for this is IBR virus, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. A lot of times the virus is associated with respiratory disease or shipping fever pneumonia, but sometimes we can see the I form of it. The common name is a red nose virus. Now on this and everything, again, unless you specifically ask for the culture of this, you won't find it. <coughs> it would be nice to say that every time we see this, we've seen a little bit of pneumonia, maybe a little pasture pneumonia or dust pneumonia, whatever you want to call it, a little bit of red nose going through them in the respiratory form, and then see the eye form. But I've looked at enough cattle, sometimes you see the respiratory form preceding or just before the eye form, and other times you do not see it. It will not exhibit itself. You just see the eye form in the form of, of pink eye. But those four things are the common causes that, that we've been able to isolate uh, recently. Now, what also is involved in the development of pink eye? Is it just those things by itself? Normally, it's like a lot of diseases we deal with. There's something that stresses or causes a breakdown in the normal system to the animal. It's, uh, let me ask a question. Uh, any of you have kids or grandkids that go to like grade school? Okay, a few of you. Do you ever know of a situation in which one of the children gets pink eye? Okay. And let's just say there's 20 kids in the class. Do all 20 kids get pink eye? No. Or do mom and dad get pink eye if their child comes home with pink eye? Generally, they don't. And the reason being because under normal circumstances, our immune system's able to combat those particular disease agents and keep, keep us clear and free of the, the disease. So generally, there's some kind of inciting cause to this. A lot of times there's irritants of some sort. It could even be chemical, like some sprays or something that might be sprayed around, you know, flies or something like that that get in the eye. A lot of times dust, where I really see a lot, uh, especially in the last couple of years, two and a half years of drought, where the um, noxious plants, I refer to them as weeds, but if you want to be official, they're noxious plants. The weeds get real dry, it's dusty. Um, we have a lot of wind up in Stillwater. I, you guys probably don't have any wind down here in this part. Of, nope, you don't. Okay, well, sometimes the wind kicks up a little dust with, and it, and it goes on past there. Okay, so you guys don't experience the dust and everything like we do. But that's enough to cause a little bit of irritation in the eyes. It's just like if you're out uh, cutting hay or something, you'll get a little bit of dust particles in your eyes, and, and you'll wipe your eyes a little bit. And then our wonderful friend, the face fly. Um, Musca autumnalis, that's a scientific term for face fly. Face flies have been associated with pink eye for, and it's been shown that increase the number of fly population, increase the incidence. I think I've even got a slide in here just to, to show you one of the original studies about this. Uh, the interesting thing, in certain parts of the country, meaning the United States, the face fly populations are decreasing. 
other parts of the country, the phase five population appears to be about the same as it's been for many, many years or, or decades. So it could be extremely variable with a group this size uh, audience with your cattle. So here's just an example. This was in Pennsylvania in 67. And basically, if we had about 10 flies per side, so in other words, the number of flies go up um, in an animal on average, we see a rise in the case of pink eye. If we double that number, roughly we got a double risk of cases of pink eye, roughly uh, one out of every four, one out of every three. The interesting thing in a study in Missouri that was subsequent to that, they could not show that correlation. There's, it's both ways out there, but the bottom line is face flies, pink eye generally go hand in hand. Most of the time it's also the classic one, which is the Moraxella bovis species. Okay. Um, this is, I put this in here, especially recently uh, this year, we've isolated both of these from um, ocular swabs. The thing about this, these guys right here, this mycoplasma species, it will look the same, but when it is submitted to the lab, you have to, or your veterinarian has to specifically request this test. And while I want to make sure I put this up here, it's n normally you will not get the answer within, say, three days or so. It may be a week, week and a half before they can finally rule yes or no, this organism's there. All right, diagnosing it, looking at it, I can, I can tell you this looks like a case of pink eye, and I would be correct in that. You guys would be too. This is pink eye. The problem is, what caused the pink eye? That's where we have to get some tests in here. And these are just swabs that we can do. It would be also nice that I could take one swab and request all three or four of those tests. Unfortunately, it will take at least three, sometimes four different swabs to be able to get the answer for this. So we've got a little bit of a challenge. And we're trying to, if we're having problems, we need to try to get a diagnosis because that will help dictate what kind of treatment to prescribe that's going to be best for the animals and also for you folks. Uh, we can also do a dye test. Has, has anybody been to an optometrist or ophthalmologist recently? You know how they put the little kind of greenish, they'll put something in your eye and dilate it. And you'll kind of, oh, this is kind of neat. And then they'll put a little drop in there and they'll shine sometimes a little UV light so it looks like a black light, you know, like at Halloween. And if it shows that it's a positive, then there's a scratch or a defect in the cornea or the surface layer of cells on your eyeball. We can also do this in cattle, and, and it works very nice. Oh, and this, can you see this little area right here? I, I use my travel pointer here. And that shows up. It's a very light yellowish-green color. And if you've got a black light, it's really, really cool to show up. Students love to see it, by the way. Treatment. One thing to know, and as we've, a lot of us have been in many, many discussions, and I would venture to say that most of us here would say we want to take care of our animals that we've been given the care to. I would say, venture to say that everybody here wants to do that. And I can pretty comfortably say that because you wouldn't take the time out of your day to come to a meeting like this. One of the things pink eye is perceived as painful or irritating to the animal. So sometimes we may actually need to address this from a welfare or well-being standpoint for the animal. Again, it will depend on a case-to-case -case basis. Just like you and I are individuals, we might respond differently to the same type of a, uh, of a situation. Fly control, and that goes back to the face fly uh, issue. Here's a nice thing. This is sound medical recommendation. I'll be honest, it's going to be hard to put this into practice. If I had some dairy cattle up in Wisconsin where I was at, pretty easy to do in the summertime, pretty easy to do in upstate New York. When I get kind of west of the Mississippi and the way cattle are raised, it's going to be hard, but that's decreased exposure of sunlight, okay? So look, it's sound recommendation. It's going to be hard to implement. There's even some evidence of vitamin supplementation that may help actually with the healing process. Because it is potentially uh, infectious, or it is infectious, some of them are potentially contagious. Uh, organisms try to isolate infected animals would be a sound recommendation. 
Again, it's going to be a challenge, especially in cow-calf and stalker operations. Topical antibiotics. Again, we're trying to put a source of antibiotic where the infection is. Um, a patch or cover. I've got this in kind of parentheses. Um, they do make commercial little patches. You use a, like a tag cement, and then you put a patch over. And so instead of moving the animal inside a barn, you're covering the eye and preventing the sunlight or exposure to UV radiation right on the eye itself. If you can get those to hang in there, that's fine. I've seen people use various cloth products um, to make their own little uh, patch. The other one is suture the eyelid shut and then come in and then remove the sutures later on, and that's another thing. Vaccination may help a little bit. Uh, plus or minus, the IBR virus included in a lot of vaccines might help in certain situations as well as some of the pink eye uh, bactrins that are out there for the Moraxella. And then injecting subconjunctively, a lot of people will roll the lid up and inject underneath the lid, and that's not where it really needs to go. It needs to go under the conjunctiva that is on the eyeball itself. It is not an easy procedure, and if the calf moves, it's very easy to accidentally stick the needle into the eye, and therefore you've lost the eye due to what you're doing, trying to help the animal out versus what the uh, illness is. Okay, any quick questions on pink eye? Is that the most effective to use? Okay, the question was LA300, which is long-acting oxytetracycline, 300 milligram per mil or cc, is that the most effective? It is one of the antimicrobials or antibiotics that is commonly used. You can use 200 milligram, you can use 300 milligram. Uh, I've had fairly good success with both of those as I have some of the other antibiotics. So the answer to the question is which is the best, <coughs> excuse me, work with a local veterinarian to find out what is working in your particular area. The other thing is I've had people that will call up and say, you know, last year I used, and, and, and pick your product. It could be a Tetrader 300. It could be a uh, Oxytet 300 long-acting LA. It could be a Biomycin 200, a Liquamycin 200, whatever on tetracyclines. It worked last year. It's not working this year. Now, of course, I don't have the information for every one of them, but sometimes these cases, when we've had a veterinarian go in and collect samples, it's not one of the organisms that's sensitive to antibiotics. So example, the herpes virus. Which antibiotic works for viruses, whether you're a human or a cow? None, zero. So therefore, you're just wasting your, your time and your money. If it's a mycoplasma, my experience has been nothing consistently works. But something may seem to work a little bit better here on, let's just say you're the west side of Payne County, that's where I'm at. If I go over here to the east side of Payne County, it doesn't seem to work. So there's a lot of variability on what's the best to treat with, and there's not a true answer to that. You've got to find out what you're dealing with. The question, are white-faced cattle more sensitive to pink eye than dark-faced cattle or pigmented cattle? There is a lot of anecdotal information out there that says, yes, that is the case. However, I have to, as a scientist, I have to take a step back right now. I would say a lot of my calls involve dark-faced cattle, primarily Angus-based cattle right now. But let's look at what's happened in the industry over the last 20 to 30 years. What's the primary base of cattle that's out there? Blackface. So the answer to your question is all cattle are susceptible. There might be some breed differences. There might be some color marking differences. But all cattle are susceptible to these organisms that we talked about. Good question. Um, I'm going to repeat the question. If your, your neighbor has a bad outbreak and in your herd or group of calves it's starting to have a problem, 
you've already got a good nutrition program. Kind of, can I rephrase it? What should you do? Again, it would be nice to know what the cause is because if it's maybe a bacteria or something, you might be able to vaccinate to, to try to get ahead. I believe most of the vaccines <coughs> require two doses. Help me out. Daryl, is that, do you know that? One dose? Okay, you might be able to get one dose to get a little bit of level of immunity in there. You could go with the IBR also. Uh, the other thing is to try to isolate and get away from the source of exposure would probably be the best thing to do. Now, this year we might be able to do it because we have had rain and we have grass. Three years prior to that, I mean, we didn't have grass, so it became a very challenging situation. Can I also add something that is generally a question that comes along with this? I've got a group of calves. Let's just say I've got 15 calves and I've got two cases of pink eye. Should I go ahead and give an antibiotic shot to the other 13? Is that a fair question to, to throw out there? I get that question frequently. And generally, no, because it goes to the normal individual situation in which we have a classroom of kids with pink eye. Not every kid's going to get it. You got to be careful. Anything you give could potentially have a reaction that may not be what you're wanting in the long run. So if you're having a viral outbreak, your antibiotics aren't going to cover you for that. For the virus, it might help you for secondary bacterial infections. I'm talking more pneumonia than I'm talking eye problems. Uh, but if you can, it's try and pull them apart. But normally, normally, I don't go treat just everybody because I, I treat on a case-by-case -case basis.